This is a class on Shakespeare's Fools. The way I teach whenever I teach is feel free to jump in, ask questions if you think you have something to add based on your own studies. I am more than happy to hear it and discuss what your thoughts are. Um, so I have, I've actually gone so far as to create a slideshow. How exciting is that? Ta-da, Shakespeare's Fools. All right, is everybody ready? Give me a thumbs up if you can see me, you can hear me, we're all good. All right. What is a fool? We have historical mention of fools. The first one that we know of comes from China. Um, there, I'm not even gonna try to say this person's name. They lived between 179 and 117 BC. And they have reference in ref, a reference in one of their books. Then come jesters, musicians, and trained dwarfs, and singing girls from the land of Titi to delight the ear and eye and bring mirth to the mind. Horace himself, back in good old Rome, wrote, Who is not a fool? We see references to them also in Russia, interestingly enough, little tidbit here. Russia's fools tended to be men or women, and they were older. They liked them because they could be snarky like older people like me can be. Um, they were all over the world. Um, they had to be multi-talented. They could jump, dance, sing, play an instrument, have witty conversation with lots of repartee. Um, a fool named Roland Le Pator was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II, probably when he retired on condition that Roland returned to the royal court every year on Christmas Day to, get ready for this, quote, leap, whistle, and fart. My kind of guy. Um, so they had to be able to do multiple things. Most of the jesters, the, the fools, the clowns that we know of, that we think of today, and a lot of them are what Shakespeare based his fools on, were um, the European English vision in reality, although this also was in France too, where they were fool to a king or a queen or a landed noble of some, store, some sort. There were three types that emerged from this world. The first is the noble family fool. And that of course is where you have Queen Elizabeth's fool, Richard Tarleton. These, these men, for the most part, I have not heard of a period Elizabethan period female fool. Um, those were the noble family fool. They were paid, they were taken well care of by that, that family, that royal. Then you have the innocent fools. The innocent fools were born on a land that was owned by, by some sort of higher up family. And these people were disfigured, disabled, uh, missing limbs. Um, they had mental disabilities as well, so they were slow. Not sure what the PC term is, sorry, but they had a lot of mental difficulties and they became the innocent fools. They were not paid for their work. They got room, they got bored, they got a, a bed on the floor. That whole joke about the, the fool sleeping on the floor in front of the master's bedroom, that, come, that was the innocent fool. And if the family got tired of them at any point in time, they would be kicked out. And the vast majority of them, when they were kicked out, became beggars. And then finally, we have the professional fool. The professional fool... Um, in France, there actually was a guild of jesters, a guild of fools, a guild of clowns. So it's, it, to me, I find that very fascinating because I'm a Terry Pratchett fan and I thought he was being sarcastic, but it actually did happen. Um, these were fool societies that were very, uh, very famous in France. They were the, generally the ones to don the classic jester's costume of a hood, like trunk monkeys wearing right here for us. 
the hood with the ears and the multicolored tunics and tie bells to their shoes or clothes. They would dance and prance through the streets, some even carrying infants on their backs. Finally, during Elizabeth's time, they began to move into the theater. I'm talking about this third group, these professional fools. So now let's talk about Shakespeare's fools. But first, I'm going to put myself on mute. Maybe not. I have to cough. <coughs> Thank you. Um, there's one commonality. Well, there's a lot of common themes between all of the fools in Shakespeare's time. They had some sort of, and I'm quoting from a book here, deformity. Charlton had a squint. Kemp had an ill face. Armin was ugly and dwarfish. They were absolutely multifaceted. They could dance, play an instrument, sing, just like we talked about as well. Super mad intelligent. Most of these three that we're going to talk about were distinguished authors in their own right. Um, the important thing before we go on to the fools is to understand that in all of the plays, there is another common theme, and I'm just talking about Shakespeare's plays. Each of the fools, they usually had a low status, a lower status than um, thinking about Falstaff. Of course, he was, he was a gentleman-ish, but Prince Hal, of course, outranked him. So he had that lower status. They spoke in colloquial prose. They spoke very pretty. And they were free, for the most part, to separate themselves from the plot and the structure of the play itself. Lots of times, especially with William Kemp, he broke that fourth wall and talked directly to the audience and interacted with them. We didn't see that as much with Armin. So we have to talk at first about Tarleton. Richard Tarleton did not perform at all, unless you want to talk about posthumously, because he was the basis for the character of Yorick, or the skull of Yorick that Hamlet uses during um, Hamlet. The, the first actor that Shakespeare was able to write for was William Kemp, and then finally Robert Armin. This is Richard Charlton. He was the Lord of Misrule in the Feast of the Fools. So the Feast of the Fools was a Christian holiday. It tied in with a holiday, but it was a day where the whole world turned upside down. So the peasants became the rulers, and the rulers became the peasants, and there were parades, and the Lord of Misrule was usually the lowest person in the society, in the church. And so Richard Charlton sort of embodied this Lord of Misrule coming from very humble beginnings. And he did that. He turned everything upside down in his performances. He was the rustic simpleton. He was also absolutely beloved by Queen Elizabeth. She thought the world of him. He was a very talented dancer, incredible playwright, um, very sad. His one of his plays, the most famous one, talked about all over the place, no sign of it. We've never found a copy of it to this day. Um, and again, York was based on him. So you can see right here, uh, this is the quote from Hamlet, alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? And when Hamlet is talking about Tarleton in this scene, there is still pain, even though we don't know for sure that Shakespeare and, and Tarleton even did anything together, but the pain felt by the entire community, entire nation perhaps, at the loss of Tarleton was this universal thing. And when Hamlet talks about it, he's speaking for everybody. And here's a lovely little woodcut of Tarleton. Any questions so far? Everybody good? Nobody's got their hand up, all right. Next we have William Kemp. William Kemp joined the Lord Chamberlain's men in 1594. He was known for his jigs. He was a very, very accomplished dancer. 
he was well loved, almost se he's second, of course, to Tarleton, but he was beloved of the people. The biggest problem that Shakespeare had with William Kemp was that he never stuck to the script. And if you see this quote down here, um, and this is Hamlet again, and let those that play your fool, your clowns, speak no more than is set down for them, for there be of them that will themselves laugh to sit on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh to. Um, his, his drinking and his improvisation with his lines drove Shakespeare batty. Um, and we only know that he left in 1599. We don't know why, but we know based on this writing in Hamlet that Shakespeare was not sad to see him go. When he left, he started up his own theater troupe in London and it flopped. It did, it did horribly and Kemp decided to gain renown for himself and did the Morris dance, the Morris jig for a hundred miles straight, trying to regain some fame. It failed, he started touring all over Europe um, and, and never ever seemed to regain the love of the people and died destitute. All right, next. Oh, what about Hamlet? So Hamlet was written between Kemp and Armin. And if you're familiar with Hamlet at all, you know that there are the grave diggers and they're called the clowns, but they're not the fools in Hamlet. The fool in Hamlet is Hamlet. And if you read Hamlet with that understanding, the, the breaking of the fourth wall, his sense of humor throughout the entire play is absolutely the lines delivered by the fool. So sure, he's our tragic hero, but he has a dual role to play. And it's the only one in all of Shakespeare's plays where his, his hero is also the fool. And that's simply because he did not have a fool to write for. So he wrote for his lead actor. Okay, good. Somebody has a second question? Yes, natural fools. We're talking about earlier back, right? Okay, share screen. What about Hamlet? We just talked about it, awesome. Finally, the final actor who was a fool with Shakespeare was Robert Armin. We don't have proof of this, which is interesting because normally this stuff is written down like all over the place, but there's nothing written down. But he was possibly Tarleton's apprentice. Um, he was very ugly and very short. He was brilliant. He wrote a lot of plays, a lot of books. He loved to fence. He loved to to jest and play with words. And you can see that in the, these eight plays that he played the fool, which we'll get to in a minute what those are. Um, you can see the change in character from the rustic, simple fool to Armin's more intellectual fool. Um, there's a woodcut of him, not this one, that shows him uh, carrying the tools of the fool. He has a handkerchief to mop his dribble a pen and ink horn, which signify this adult has yet to complete his schooling. That's from the book, Shakespeare's Clown. He was absolutely upwardly mobile. He hated being an actor. He wanted to be a Lord. He wanted to be recognized as Tarleton had been to, for being the toast of London, to have Elizabeth adore him. And that never happened. And, and you know, interestingly enough, this is an SEA class, right? As much as you want to get a peerage, as hard as you work for it, you never get it until you give up. And that is something Armin didn't learn. There you go, little SEA moment there. Um, Touchstone was his most memorable character. Um, and I agree with that simply because As You Like It is my favorite Shakespeare play. 
He was a counter tenor, so he sang very high. He had an absolutely beautiful voice. Um, so let's talk a little more about him before we go on. Good. <clears throat> so the difference between Armin and Kemp was pretty big. Armin was far more the gentleman, far more, um, he didn't like playing the simpleton. He liked showing off his brain. He liked showing off his brilliance to the audience. And it, it made him less favored than Kemp had been when Kemp was acting. Kemp brought to his, his parts this, I'm trying to find the right words, but Kemp just seemed to love what he was doing, even if he was a drunk and even if he made up his lines, he just had this natural talent. And Armin seemed to have to push himself to be the fool and wanted to be respected more as a real person, right? But he was, did not fit society's norms back then, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the roles that Armin played, his licensed fools that he played in Shakespeare, um, in, the, in the Chamberlains, was um, Touchstone, and as you like it, I talked about, Bestie, in Twelfth Night, The Fool in King Lear, Lavach in All's Well That Ends Well, and perhaps uh, Thirst, Sir, I can't say this name, Thirst Siltes in Troilus and Cressida, The Porter in Macbeth, The Fool in Timon of Athens, and Articulus in The Winter's Tale. Those fools, and what, what I find interesting I'm gonna put us on gallery view. Is that okay, Maggie? I'm doing it anyway, so we can all converse. It's so weird to not see your faces. When you look at someone like Touchstone, does everybody understand and know what a Touchstone is? So a Touchstone is your base of reality. So when you see Touchstone, he is the one who keeps us grounded in the real world as they're off in the forest having these adventures duke senior running around look everybody's having all this drama touchstone is the one who is simple but keeps everybody grounded in the real world and that's what he brought to his fool versus kemp's fall staff was there's no of course, there's a basis in reality. I think we all know somebody who has some similarities to Falstaff, right? But he was over the top with his foolishness. And I wonder, and I think a lot about how much Shakespeare hated writing for him versus how he got to truly develop and grow with his fools once he had Armin underneath him, working with him. And I, I believe very strongly the growth of Shakespeare as a writer happened after Armin joined the troupe. Cool, questions? No, all right, we'll go back and make people happy. Maybe not, we got lost, we'll go back here then. So, Tarleton, Kemp, and Armin, we're not just performers with the troupe. They were also accomplished performers on their own and they did perform outside of the Lord Chamberlain's players. They did other things that you, so player actors in Shakespeare's time did not make a lot of money. Understand as well that they didn't have costumes provided to them. So they had to have their own outfit and then if they were doing, for example, Julius Caesar, they would grab a sheet or something similar and make a toga to wear over their Elizabethan outfit. So they had to do other things to make money. And so these three gentlemen absolutely did all these solo acts. A lot of them had to do with singing because they were all three very talented singers. 
Um, and I got this information uh, from a book called Actors and Acting in Shakespeare's Time, the act of stage playing. When we're all done, I can share um, the bibliography if people want. So the book also tells us um, they, they did their, the three actors, they had performances even in the play. So like Entre Act would be one of them coming out and telling a story, singing a song, dancing a jig. So they played like most actors even today, they all had to play many roles. So they would come out and perform and sometimes Kemp would be more requested than the play itself. And that also, I think, added to Shakespeare not being super happy with him. So that is the lecture portion of this course. It is a real rough overview, and we can dive in deeper if people want, but when I teach, I want to encourage people. I don't want to spoon feed you information. I want you to go, I want to learn more versus me telling you all this stuff. Because if you go down the path of research into these characters and into Shakespeare's schools, you're going to find gold mine of information out there. So just understand that he wrote these plays, these roles of fools in his plays for these actors and their strengths. And I think, I haven't spent a lot of time researching that, that he did the same for all of his actors. All right, Anne says, oh, what did you say? The snarky old Russian fools. I'll have to find the link. I think I closed that tab. It's, I found it in a Google book and I was like, that is so cool. Um, so we're doing, so um, Anne also said, I like the idea of Hamlet as fool. I'd never thought of it that way, but it makes sense, right? Once you hear that, you're like, OMG. Now I understand his sense of humor, his snarkiness, his biting humor. I mean, he's just brilliant and witty. And that's because he was the fool. Um, little plug right now, a bunch of us over in the East Kingdom. Um, I don't live in the East Kingdom, but I used to. We're doing Hamlet, a Zoom performance of Hamlet on July 12th. It's going to be streamed to the East Kingdom YouTube channel. I think it's at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, questions? Anyone? Maybe. Does everybody see the link with the scene work in the chat here? Um, one thing that I had um, heard about uh, Falstaff um, specifically is that Shakespeare um, in Henry the in um, yeah, I think in um, like after Falstaff kind of walks away with um, Henry V, that uh, or not the 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 first play that Falstaff was in, which I can't remember. Um, Henry the Fourth, Part One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Henry the Fourth, Part One. That that's why Falstaff dies in Henry the Fourth, Part Two. And that base and that um, basically that's why uh, and that um, Mary Wives of Windsor was with Falstaff was written because Queen Elizabeth got really upset by that. And, and she wanted like, to see him in a love story. She wanted yeah, and to was see like, him. write another play with Falstaff. Yes, I read and, that and I, too. Yeah. And I wondered if, I, I, I didn't know if that story was true and I kind of is, so. I think, I mean, I've read it in more than one book. I think I read it in two, but you know, a book, I, I know that they research, but whether that's, that is correct or just rumor, I don't know. They made it sound like it was truth. Um, trying to see when, when it was written because Mary Wives would not oh it would have been played by him by Kemp because it was written in 1597 right so okay so Falstaff was was uh played by Kemp and not actually uh 
Oh, William Kemp. Yep. Nope. Got it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, I was reading on the matter, and uh, the Queen enjoyed Kemp so much that that she wanted the sequel for uh, Falstaff. Sheila, and it's sad because you know you think about actors today that like have really great roles in in TV shows, and they leave because they want to strike out on their own, and then they bomb horribly. Right. And that I, I can't help but think that's what Kemp must have thought he could do, that he could leave and not perform anymore there with the troupe. And then maybe the queen would take him on and sponsor him like she did with Charlton. And none of that happened, which left him in the end destitute. So Anne says, you can unmute yourself if you want, Anne. I mean, you don't have to. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, I, that was more of an aside comment, uh, but uh, sure. Uh, the way you're describing Kemp reminds me so much of my feelings about Jim Carrey and Will Ferrell as uh, comedians, as uh, they can be really great when they're actually following a script, but when they're just left to do whatever they want, they it, there's just nothing. Uh, it's too much <laughs> chaos. Right, right. Versus someone like, Robin Williams was a Tarleton. Like okay, he just I had this that. comedic genius about him that, I mean, he didn't, not that he didn't misstep with his humor sometimes, but he just seemed to be connected to the divine brain in some way when it came to, to his humor. Um, all right, do you guys wanna read some scenes? Does everybody wanna unmute and take some parts and we can, play. This is a sure. pretty big part of this stuff. I need you. I'll, I'll volunteer. I'm, I'm not afraid. Good. Don't be afraid. I don't bite unless you ask me really nicely. All right. So we have these scenes. Anyone else want to play? Just the three of us? All right. We'll have to double up. Okay. I've got multiple screens happening here. So the first scene in this is, as you like it, as I said, my favorite. We have um, Armin play Touchstone in this. So we need a Jacques who is um, uh, also kind of a fool. It's very interesting. Anyway, so we need a Jacques. Um, Anne, will you do Jacques? Sure. Trunk monkey. Is that legit what I'm calling you? All right, rock on with yourself, dude. <laughs> You do three touchstone and I will stretch myself and read Duke Senior. Good, my lord. Oh, sorry. Nope. Are Go we ahead. starting? Yep. Good, my lord. Bid him welcome. This is the motley minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest. He have been a courtier, he, he swears. If any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. I have trod a measure. I have flattered a lady. I've been politic with my friend, smooth with mine enemy. And I've outdone three tailors. I have four quarrels and like to have fought one. And how was that taying up? Faith, we met and found the quarrel was upon the seventh cause. How seventh cause? Good, my lord, like this fellow. I like him very well. God lead you, sir. I desire you for the like. I press in here, sir, amongst the rest of the country, culpatives to swear and forswear according as marriage binds and blood breaks. A poor virgin, sir, an ill-favored thing, sir, but my own, a poor humor of mine, sir, to take that. Sorry, this is really, really small. Bear with me. Let me blow it up a little bit. Uh, a humor of mine, sir, to take that that no man else will. Rich honestly dwells like a monsieur, sir, in the poor house as your peril in your foul oyster. By my faith, he is very swift and sententious. According to the fool's, fool's bolt, sir, and such <clears throat> good disease. But for the seventh cause, how did you find the quarrel on the seventh cause? 
Upon a lie seven times removed, bear your body more seeming, Audrey. As thus, sir, I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. He sent me word, if I said his beard was not cut well, he was in the mind it was. This is called the retort courteous. I sent him word again, it was not well cut. He would send me word, he cut it please himself. This is called the quip modest, and again, it was not well cut. He, dis he disabled my judgment. This is called the reply churlish, if again, it was not well cut. He would answer, I spake not true. This is called the reproof val valetain, and again, it was not well cut. He, sa he would say I lied. This is the countercheck quarrelsome. And so to the lie, circumstantial and the lie direct. And how oft did you say his beard was not well cut? I durst go no further than the lie circumstantial, nor he durst not give me uh, the lie direct. So we measured swords and parted. Can you nominate in order now the degrees of the lie? Oh, sir, we quarrel in print. By the book, as you have books for good manners, I, have, I will name you the degrees. The first, the retort courteous. The second, the quip modest. The third, the reply churlish. The fourth, reproof valiant. The fifth, the quarter check quarrelsome. The sixth, the lie within circumstance. The seventh, the lie direct. All these you may avoid, but the lie direct. And you may avoid that too with an if. I knew when the seventh justices could take up the, a quarrel, when, but when the parties were met themselves, one of them thought but as an if. If you say so, then I say so. And they shook hands and swore brothers. Your if is the only peacemaker. Much virtue in if. Is this not a rare fellow, my lord? He's as good at anything and yet a fool. So do you see in this scene the sheer brilliance? Not only, of course, we have Shakespeare's sheer, sheer brilliance, but Armin's delivery of this, Armin as a person, Armin as an actor, to lead Shakespeare to write this character, these lines, these lines are so like everybody that I know who studies Shakespeare loves this monologue of the lie. It, it is just witty repartee at its highest. And that's the, the fool that Armin loved to play. Does anybody else want to play with us or is it just going to be us three still? And that's okay. I'm not going to try to guilt you into playing with us too hard. Okay. So now we have um, a Kemp role. Kemp. So Kemp was starting to really tick Shakespeare off. And this play, um, Much Ado About Nothing, sorry, Much Ado was one of the last ones that Kemp was in. And I wonder if he sort of, Shakespeare sort of purposely tried to tick him off to get Kemp to leave. This is an insulting fool role for a professional fool. It's a fun role to play as an actor, but imagine you're living back then in the 1590s, you're a professional fool. You make money as a fool, not just for Shakespeare, but romping around London being a fool right, singing, dancing, doing all this stuff, and you have to play a character like Dogberry? Like, seriously, that is like the most insulting thing. And I do wonder if this is why Kemp left. Because it's insulting. It's an absolutely insulting role for him. What okay. About it, what about it is insulting? Like, like, can we go into a bit of detail before we actually start the reading? So when you look at the fools, like even false, this was false tech, right? He was smart. Dogberry is not smart. Dogberry is an idiot. Dogberry only happens to find out the truth through his stupidity, not because he's an intelligent character. That alone is insulting to make Kemp play a stupid person when Kemp is a genius. So, so that's, 
my, I mean, that we know that this is one of the last roles that he played. And so now let's connect the lines. Could they be, could they be related? I haven't read anything saying yes or no, but I think that this could play a part of it. As an actor, I would be insulted. It's a small part. It's not very big. Falstaff is a huge role. Dogberry is a tiny walk-on. He's got some juicy lines, but he's an idiot. Good? All right. So, Anne, can you read Dogberry? Sure. Monkey, can you read Verges? I will read the sexton. Uh, and then we're going to have to divvy up the other ones. Um, Trunk Monkey, Watchman 1, I'll do Watchman 2, and you can do Conrad and I'll do Baracchio. Sound good? So we're playing all the bit parts and gets the juicy, awesome part. Uh, which, uh, which Watchman do you name me? One or two? One. Okay. Is our whole disassembly appeared? Oh, a stool and a cushion for the sexton. Which be the malefactors? Mary, that am I and my partner. Nay, that's certain. We have the exhibition to examine. But which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yea, Mary, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Oh, my Baracchio, is that what I said? Baracchio. <laughs> Pray, write down Baracchio. Yours, Sarah? I guess I'm Conrad. I'll, yeah. I'll play Conrad. I'm a gentleman, sir, and my name is Conrad. Write down, Master General Conrad. Masters, do you serve God? Yea, we yeah, hope. Sir, we hope. Write down that they hope they serve God, and write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters, it is proved already that you are a little better than false knaves, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. A marvelous witty fellow, I assure you, but I will go about with him. Come you hither, sirrah, a word in your ear. Sir, I say to you, it is thought you are false knaves. Sir, I say to you, we are none. Well, stand aside. For God, they are both in a tale. Have you written down that they are none? Master Constable, you know go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are their accusers. Yea, Mary, that is the eftest way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you, in the prince's name, accuse these men. This man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down, Prince John a villain. Why, this is flat perjury to call a prince's brother villain. Master Constable. Pray thee, fellow peace, I do not like thy look, I promise thee. What heard you say, him say else? Oh, now I'm playing myself again. <laughs> Mary, that he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady hero wrongfully. Flat burglary as ever was committed. Yeah, by mass that it is. What else, fellow? And then Count Claudio did mean, upon his words, to disgrace hero before the whole assembly and not marry her. Oh, villain, thou wilt be condemned to everlasting redemption for this. What else? This is all. And this is more, masters, than you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Hero was in this manner accused, in this very manner refused, and upon the grief of this suddenly died. Master Constable, let these men be bound and brought to Leonardo's. I will go before and show him their examination. Come, let them be opinioned. Let them be in the hands. Off, come, cocks come. God's my life, where's the sexton? Let him write down the prince's offer, officer coxcomb. Come, bind them, thou naughty varlet. Away, you are an ass. You are an ass. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were here to write me down an ass. 
Blood Masters, remember that I am an ass, though it not be written down, yet not forgot that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I'm a wise fellow, and, which is more, an officer, and, which is more, a householder, and, which is more, a pretty a piece of flesh as any in Messina, and one that knows the law, go to, and a rich fellow enough, go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath had hath two gowns and everything handsome about him. Bring him away! Oh, that I had written, been written down an ass! I, you know, I'm, I'm starting to wonder, man, did Kemp quit right then and there for him to be saying over and over, I'm an ass? Because you know Shakespeare thought that of him. Like, there's just no, based on what he wrote about him later. Whew, good times. All right, so now, you guys ready to keep going? Sure. Yeah, little time. I got to leave around seven, per se, but... Uh... Uh, we got like 20 minutes. Yeah, I have something happening at that time too. I'm actually jumping from this to Hamlet rehearsal. So um, nobody else wants to play? Nobody else wants to read Hamlet? Uh, I can read Hamlet. Just All right. You, need. you go ahead and read Hamlet. I'm just giving everybody else in the class a chance. And can you read the first player, please? And again, <laughs> before we read this, remember, Hamlet is the fool. Okay. okay. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, tripling on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as life the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as if I may, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustness, periwig hated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the grounding for the most part are capable of nothing but explicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellowship whipped for ongoing tournament in out Herod's Herod, pray you, avoid it. I warrant your honor. Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word. The word to the action, with the special oysterip, not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone it from the purpose of playing, whose end both at the first and now was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image. And the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now, this overdone or come tardy off, through it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judiousness grieve, the censor of which one must in your allowance or go a whole theater of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that neither having the ascent of Christians, nor the gate of Christians, pagan or man, have so stuttered and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They immediate humanity so abominably. I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether, and let those that play your clowns speak no more than it is set down for them. For there be of them that would themselves laugh, to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. Though, 
In the meantime, some necessarily question of the play be then to be considered. That villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fools that use it. Go, make your ready. So what's interesting about this is you see his humor and his tragic hero-ness all wrapped up into these these monologues, these, these, they're, they're not soliloquies, obviously. So that's what's interesting about the character of Hamlet, and it, it doesn't exist in any of Shakespeare's other plays. It's only there because he didn't have a fool to play the part. Um, and I think it explains why Hamlet, of all of them, is the most famous. Um, finally, let's go down, if you can, to page 11 where we have Henry the fourth part one here. And we're gonna switch it. Anne, can you read uh, Falstaff? Sure. And Trunk Monkey, do you wanna read Prince Hal? Uh, Prince Henry? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Points, points and be hanged, points. Peace, you fat kidney rascal. What have you brawling dost thou keep? Where's Points, Hal? He has walked up to the top of the hill. I'll go seek him. I am accursed to rob in that thief's company. The rascal hath removed my horse and tied him I know not where. If I travel but four foot by the squire further afoot, I shall break my wind. Well, I doubt not but to die a fair death for all this, if I escape hanging for killing that rogue. I have forsworn his company hourly any time this two and twenty years, and yet I am bewitched with the rogue's company. If the rascal hath not given me medicines to make me love him, I'll be hanged. It could not be else. I have drunk medicines. Points! How? A plague upon you both, Bardolph. Pato, I'll starve ere I rob a foot th further, and twere not as good a Deed is drink to turn true man and to leave these rogues. I am the veriest varlet that ever chewed with a tooth. Eight yards of uneven ground is three score and ten miles a foot with me, and the stony hearted villains know it well enough. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be true to one another. <laughs> nice whistling. That was me. Whew! A plague upon you all. Give me my horse, you rogues. Give me my horse and be hanged. Peace, ye fat guts. Lie down. Lie thy ear close to the ground and list if thou canst hear the tread of travelers. Have you any levers to lift me up again, being down? Split, I'll not bear mine own flesh so far afoot again for all the coin in thy father's exchequer. What a plague mean ye to colt me thus. Thou lies, thou we can stop there. I think you have enough of an idea of yeah. all staff, right? He's brilliant, brilliant writing, brilliant role. Remember again, Shakespeare wrote this character for Kemp. Kemp inspired Falstaff. And again, how insulting he must have, how little he thought of Kemp at the end when he made him Dogberry. And so I think if you go back and you look at the eight plays that Armin did, you can see how much respect Shakespeare had because he gave him such juicy parts to play, such fun, incredible, wonderful roles to play. And the difference between the two, and you can see that the fools towards the end of Shakespeare's career became better and better and better and better versus Kemp's career with Shakespeare, the fools after Falstaff just sort of piffled out. So that takes us to 10 till. Normally we have some questions. So if anybody has one, that's the class. So if you have any questions, please ask. Um, thanks, this was really great. I think the only question I could think of, and I don't know if there's a good answer for it, but I've noticed that in some of Shakespeare's plays, there's a fool who sometimes has a name and sometimes doesn't. And um, I guess I don't know if that, if uh, there's any sort of history there that you've stumbled on in terms of uh, 
naming some of the full characters or if that just is an editing error? So which ones are you, t which characters are you talking about that don't have names? Are you talking about the Hamlet, the Grave Diggers? Uh, well, I was thinking of, well, I think all's well that ends well. There's a fool and um, it sometimes has a name and I forget what name they gave him. Um, but what's, I don't remember. Oh, uh, right now. Oh, and um, Twelfth Night. I'm not sure that he has a consistent name either. Hmm. Lavach is the fool, is the clown in Lavache. All's Well that okay. ends, well, ends Well. God, I haven't read that one in a while. And what was the yeah, other one? Uh, Twelfth Night. I thought, did I not mention that one? Oh. I may have been uh, in the process of switching from Facebook Live to Zoom. I don't remember if I mentioned him or not. Festies. 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 Okay, thank you. So he's part of the household the Countess of Olivia. Oh my gosh, do you remember there's that awesome version of it? Now I'm going to date myself. It was a really great one. Was that Video. the one in the mid-90s? Yes, that was a yeah. really good version. I love that one. Um, okay. Hit me up anytime anybody wants to geek Shakespeare. Um, hit Trunk Monkey up if you want to geek fools. All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Thank and you for hit teaching. Hit me up if you have any questions.